This video is sponsored by Brilliant.org. Hey, hey, Marcus House with you here, and what an incredible week SpaceX has had. A wonderfully successful Crew Dragon in-flight abort test, loads of Starship updates and construction work being done in Boca Chica, Texas, and to top it all off, we have another incredible Starlink flight coming up. Loads to talk about today, so let's get stuck into it. Okay, Neil, we can see you coming down the ladder now. Along with the Crew Dragon in-flight abort test, SpaceX is just about to launch Starlink 3, which confusingly will be actually the fourth batch of 60 Starlink satellites to launch. The reason for the interesting naming here is that the first set of 60 were considered version 0.9 satellites, Starlink 1, 2 and 3 are the version 1s. With the Starlink network, SpaceX will soon be providing fast internet access globally, and if it all works as expected with the expected network performance and the adequate consumer interest, SpaceX will have a substantial new revenue stream, presumably allowing much greater investment in the ultimate goal of colonizing Mars. With this upcoming launch, there will be around 240 Starlink satellites in orbit, making it much larger than any other fleet of commercial satellites in operation. This mission will be very very similar to Starlink No. 2's mission, which launched only a few weeks ago. The stack of 60 satellites will be deployed in one orbital plane at around 290 kilometers in altitude. These satellites will be using their own onboard Krypton-powered ion thrusters to place themselves into their final resting orbit, expected to be around 550 kilometers in altitude. But they don't all start raising their orbits together. Interestingly, it now appears that the batches of 60 satellites are actually being split over time into three groups of 20 to provide better earlier coverage than the initial proposal, which from memory had around 60 satellites in 24 orbital planes. The new proposal is around 20 satellites in 72 orbital planes. Now the way they do this is interesting. SpaceX are using different altitudes and precession rates to distribute each group into three separate orbital planes. Now this latest mission has been pushed back twice now, first to Friday and more recently has been pushed back again with SpaceX saying that the weather in the recovery area continues to be unfavorable. The team is now targeting Monday, January the 27th for the launch of Starlink pending range availability. This mission will be launching with the booster designated B 1051. This is the same booster that launched Crew Dragon's Demo 1 mission as well as the Radar Sat constellation last year. So it'll be the third flight for the booster and the second drone ship landing. Now, if you would like to know a little more about Starlink, I've got a more in-depth video here about how I think Starlink will quite literally change the world. And while you're here, please do consider subscribing. There is loads of news coming up with Starlink, Starship and Crew Dragon, and I'd love to share all that with you. Over to Boca Chica now for some Starship development news. Now, there has been a massive amount of work going on here over the last few weeks. Late last week, S. Padre captured this footage of the ship Go Discovery arriving near Boca Chica with the new parts sent down from the site at Florida. On board here was another construction stand, a range of other metal plates and supplies, and it'll all presumably be utilized soon with Starship development. Now, if you're not following S. Padre already, I certainly recommend checking out the channel from the link in the description. I'm just showing a little slice of the footage here, but you can check out the full content direct from the channel as soon as it drops. Now we've seen some more rapid construction of another large tent structure here. This I think is going to allow multiple starships to be constructed simultaneously. We look to have another much taller vehicle assembly building and windbreak structure well under construction as well, which looks to me like it could be almost a complete clone of the first we can see here. Elon tweeted out a fantastic shot of what he called the improved accommodations for the dome and ring segment sitting inside. This is a great shot and it can certainly put into perspective just how massive these tent structures are. Along with this we've learned that SpaceX has finished two more propellant domes. As Elon tweeted back in December, a clean room environment is needed for better welding, so these structures are making all this a reality and the dome we see here looks much cleaner than that previously created. The SpaceX team and their supporting suppliers are doing amazing work ramping up the Starship production. Now there has been a lot of talk about whether this was the start of the Starship build or whether it was the start of a second test tank to improve more on the design of the domes. Road closure notifications did seem to suggest it could be a second test tank and of course as it turned out that is exactly what it was. Footage here by Boca Chica Gal with NASA Spaceflight has made this super obvious. The bulkhead has been flipped upside down and the construction is continuing there. 
there. Last week we also saw the construction crew pull the first test tank apart after the pressure test. This tank had done its job but there was obviously enough improvement to be made before starting the SN1 Starship. One shot here that is particularly interesting to me is this one with the construction workers feeding rolls of steel into the ring machine. It looks to me like they have quite dramatically improved the process for the ring development. We can already see some ring segments being stacked and stored away, but I think we'll certainly be seeing some more substantial ring stacking going on very soon. Now thanks as always to Boca Chica Gal and NASA Spaceflight for continually shooting this content to share with the community. Again, I'm only using small segments of footage, but to be informed right away and get notified of the latest amazing shots, I've got a link to NASA Spaceflight's YouTube channel in the description. Now, I've got to say the parts here for the SN1 Starship are super interesting. We have this spherical header tank here looking very steampunk in its design. The header tanks are essentially there to contain the landing propellant. If these remain near full at all times, they can be insulated to minimize boil off of the cryogenic fuel. Also, because they would remain full until final landing burns, they avoid having the fuel sloshing around like the main tanks, which can not only make the engine starts difficult, but very dangerous due to other gases getting into the lines. In zero G, the fuel will all just float around in the main tanks. So to restart an engine, small amounts of thrust using reaction control systems is generally needed just so the fuel can settle into the bottom of the tanks. With a header tank, this issue can be largely avoided. In the Mark I Starship, this had been placed into the nose of the ship to help balance the ship better. This seemed unusual to me because there seems to be a clear benefit to having the header tanks placed inside the main fuel tanks, um, it's easier to keep cool and keeps the fuel system separated from the main crew and cargo areas of the ship. If we were to ever see a version of the Starship that opens right up like this older mock Starship by Gravitation Innovation, header tanks in the nose would clearly get in the way and limit such a deployment method. I suspect in future designs we may see header tanks return to the main fuel tank, but at this point in time it is certainly still combined into the new nose cone which has been transported to the launch site for testing. Now check this guy out, this looks like some crazy laddering here, <laughs> I've got no idea what's going on here, but it's nice to see someone holding that ladder in place there. So yes there is so much going on at Boca Chica it's hard to keep up with it all. With everything rapidly progressing here we'll soon have unmanned starships delivering cargo to Mars. It's going to be very interesting to see where Starship development will be in a few months time. This wonderful wallpaper here from Gravitation Innovation is just awesome by the way. A link to the site is in the description. If you love this content, head over and support the work. It really is just amazing to see what the community comes out with here. Now unless you've been living under a rock, you've likely already heard plenty about SpaceX's in-flight abort test of the Crew Dragon last Sunday. SpaceX's mission was to create a launch environment that would simulate an emergency early on in the flight. At that point, the Crew Dragon and attached trunk are programmed to detect such an issue and rapidly fire its eight Super Draco engines and decouple from the booster to escape the potential massive explosion underneath. Before humans are allowed on board this spacecraft, NASA needed to be sure that astronauts would be safe in such a scenario, so this mission was always going to be an exciting one. The flight test was delayed one day due to rough weather, but the short delay was well worth the wait. The mission went perfectly. As intended, the Falcon 9 launched from Pad 39A, the exact same pad used by the Saturn V and Space Shuttle. At around 84 seconds into the flight, at around 19 kilometers in altitude, the booster engine shut down. At this point, the Crew Dragon capsule fired up its Super Draco engines, pushing it away from the booster. You can see in this video tweeted by SpaceX just how rapidly this occurs. Now, Elon explained in the press conference after the flight that in this test, it was the capsule that triggers the abort by first sending a signal to the booster to shut down the engines. The booster experienced that sudden loss of thrust right at the same time as we can see the Super Dracos firing up to push the capsule and trunk away. This footage I believe is shot at around one quarter speed so it gives us some nice detail compared to the live footage. Around 10 seconds after the separation the out of control booster is pitching dangerously into the airstream. At this point the booster can't take the aerodynamic pressures and a spectacular explosion occurs with the entire first stage being converted into the 
this brilliant fireball. What happens next here though I find particularly interesting. It was assumed I think by most people that the second stage would break up with the rest of the booster, but it didn't. For those that don't know, the second stage of the Falcon 9 is this part here that normally separates after the main first stage booster has finished its burn. This second stage normally takes the payload all the way to orbit. Now, just after the explosion, we can see the debris here screaming out of the fireball, and this larger component is in fact that second stage, still fully fueled and intact. As it falls, it incredibly seems to find a natural orientation without breaking up, falling nose first down through the atmosphere to finally smash into the ocean at an incredible speed. This photo here taken by John Krause actually shows the explosion as it smashes into the ocean. Thank you John for sharing these. So the rest of the test went very smoothly. After the explosion, SpaceX switched to the camera on the Crew Dragon itself, and we watched this wonderful shot of the trunk separating away. Interestingly, the trunk itself made it all the way down to the ocean and was fished out. It actually appeared to be in good condition, so that is a tough piece of equipment right there. Even Elon Musk seemed intrigued here, saying that the Dragon trunk was recovered in surprisingly good shape. The drogue chutes and the main chutes all perform perfectly as well before splashdown, and these are the new Mark III chutes, and they're of course the newly developed versions. These have already been tested successfully in over 10 separate drop tests, so it's great to see these in action performing flawlessly. An incredibly successful mission, and since then we've had a little bit more information. Jim Bridenstine excitedly tweeted out this image of the recovered Crew Dragon, saying that the teams from SpaceX and from the US Air Force rehearsed crew recovery operations before bringing the spacecraft back to port. And just take a look at that. With the exception of a few scuff marks, it still looks like a near new capsule. So yes, another massive success by SpaceX. That was the last major test that was needed before the crew will be stepping on board, which sounds like it'll be no earlier now than April at this point. Possibly a little longer than that, which is probably a little further down the track than what many may have been thinking. Regardless though, this is all extremely exciting news, and I think looking back and reflecting on these achievements is important. As Elon said here, without the support NASA has provided over the years, what SpaceX have achieved would simply not have happened. Happened. Without that incredibly important funding for crew resupply service missions and the upcoming Crew Dragon missions, SpaceX wouldn't exist as we see them today. With Crew Dragon soon being able to launch astronauts to the space station and dock autonomously, who knows what may be possible in the future. Could it perhaps be possible for future Dragon vehicles to assist the International Space Station with orbit raising adjustments similar to what we've seen in the past with Cygnus? I'm wondering if it could be possible for the vessel to use its much smaller Draco engines to assist as well. If you have seen any information on that topic or have any thoughts on that, let me know in the comments. It is quite interesting because a small thrust over time, even with something as small as Draco engines, can quite dramatically raise the opposing side of the orbit. As an example, around 2 meters per second of acceleration can raise the orbit of the station by several kilometers. That's really no more than a fast walk. Boeing's Starliner uh, is designed to be doing something very similar via its reaction control systems as shown here. It's actually super interesting to understand how orbits work and how they're influenced in these ways. Small adjustments can be made super efficiently when doing them just at the optimal time. It can all seem quite complicated, but it's amazing how intuitive it can be once you understand the basics of orbital mechanics. Now, if you are a curious person and would love to understand these topics in more detail, I highly recommend checking out Brilliant.org. Topics such as gravity and orbital mechanics are exactly what Brilliant is great for. It is this wonderful structured set of concepts that builds your understanding from a basic topic to a much more advanced progression of the subject. Take this course on gravitational physics. You start off learning how to calculate the effects of gravity on a falling object. Pretty simple, right? Well, quickly you'll find yourself expanding this knowledge right up to being able to calculate the altitude of a geostationary orbit that allows satellites to match Earth's rotational speed. This is why Brilliant is so unique. The topics are broken down to easily understand, and then you can apply that understanding to more advanced related areas. 
Thank you very much to Brilliant for their support of the channel. And if you would like to help support me and would like to give it a try, go to brilliant.org slash Marcus House. The first 200 people will get 20% off for the first year of Brilliant Premium. The link is in the description below. So I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please do take a second and hit that like button. A huge thank you to my quality control squad here for helping me research and proof the material for these videos. If you're interested in these topics and would like to be part of this, follow my Discord or Twitter link in the description and please do get in touch. In the tile in the bottom left today, we have my video the other week talking a little more in depth about Starlink missions. In the top right is my latest video, and in the bottom right, content that YouTube has selected from my channel just for you. Thank you everyone for watching, and we'll see you all in the next video.